Okay, let's move on, Kevin. We've got a guest that's waiting for us. Can you please give that person a call, please? Hello. Am I calling a house of pain? What's going on, brother? How you doing, man? Bull pain, how are you? It's Rick from the Undisputed Wrestling Show. How are you, sir? Fantastic, brother. What's going on, my friend? Hey, we've got a couple guys on here as well. We've got a, an independent wrestler down in the uh, southeast corner of the U.S. The Morning Star, Will Huckabee, is joining us. And also our producer, Killa Kev, is also with us as well. And we're ready to ask you a few questions and see how things go. Now, before we get started, I, I've been promoting this show as the Beauty and the Beast show, Bull. <laughs> I must be the beauty, right? <laughs> well... Unfortunately, we couldn't get through to her. Her line is down tonight, so oh. I guess you you can be the beauty if you choose. And we'll let we'll have to be be the beast. <laughs> no, that's Terry Sims' job, man. That's not me, brother. That's <laughs> Terry Garvey, you know Terry Sims. He's the beauty always. So, Bull, let's talk talk about wrestling. Obviously, what got you started in this crazy, wacky world that we all love? Well, you know, uh, it all started when I was a kid, man. Uh, when I was when I was a young boy, me and my brothers loved it. I mean, we'd we'd race home from church on Sundays and watch Burn Gagne's AWA right after church it was on like noon or something, and and that you know that just started the ball rolling and it just uh, it snowballed. You know, I mean, it's 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 a funny thing because for a while there, I I kind of grew out of it, and then I thought ah, I got to do that shit, and then all of a sudden <laughs> um, my football career just stopped and. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I did all kinds of stupid stuff. I fought the tough man contest. I did some uh, karate tournaments and all that silly shit. And then finally, I said, "Hey, I, you know, I just decided uh, wrestling kind of pulled me like a magnet, man." So then I just started uh, training to be a wrestler, and uh, I, I've been doing it ever since. The bull. Did you have any particular guys? I mean, you just mentioned the AWA, but did you have any particular wrestlers that you really idolized and kind of wanted to pattern oh, yourself yeah. after? Oh, yeah, it was definitely a, a few of the guys that I, I really loved their work. Uh, Bret Hart, I thought, was one of the greatest. And Hart Anderson, and I, I liked our, uh, Barry Windham when he was with the Four Horsemen. And uh, there, yeah, there was definitely a few guys that definitely influenced my work. I tried to emulate some of their stuff because of the fact I just thought they were just perfection in the ring. So early in your career, I guess, who, who trained you to be a wrestler? Was there any particular names, or did you go to a school, or how did you get going? Well. Uh, uh, actually, the two guys that trained me is, uh, was Tom Rocky Stone, who was, uh, who was an enhancement guy for, uh, for Burn Guy. And he did a little bit of territory work in Kansas City, and I think he did some down in Street for for Watts, and, and a few other places. And then, I saw uh, the NWA the quite Milkman. a bit, too. Yeah, and then Jake the Milkman Milliman, too. He was a very, very, uh, strong influence on my career, too. So I guess getting started in the business as a young guy, I mean, you you obviously were working in ECW for a while and, and the IWA. How did you get hooked up into the hardcore style? Uh, well, you know, the hardcore style started with me because it was uh, another avenue to get booked. It wasn't something that I really, uh, I really wanted to get involved in, but it just kind of, the business was turning that way for a little while. So... I felt I felt uh, I needed to learn and I needed to be good at it because uh, that, that's that's what everybody was booking. If you didn't know how to work the barbed wire and you didn't know how to work the bats and you didn't know how to work the glass or the thumbtacks and all that other stuff, you didn't get booked. So you know, to me, it was just another avenue to to get booked and another thing to learn. You know, it's just just like when you work in Mexico or you work in Canada or you work down south or you work on the East Coast or you work Puerto Rico or Japan or whatever. Every place is a little bit different, so you have to learn the style. And once you learn the style, you can put it in your under your belt, and and now uh, you know when somebody asks you to do it, you say, "Yeah, I can do it. I've done it before." You know. Now, Bull, you've had legitimate badasses that you've been in the ring with, especially early in your career. I mean, what was it like, you know, being pummeled by men like Stan the Lariat Hanson and Bruiser Brody and people like that? What'd you learn? <laughs> what'd you learn from working with those stiff wrestlers? I'll tell you what, I must not have learned much because I should have been smart and hung on my boots and went home and never got back <laughs> in the ring again. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, my first TV match I ever had was for Vern Gagne was against Brody. And uh, I didn't get to meet him. I didn't get to talk to him. And I, it was his first like, first day in. And uh, they, the air, airline had lost his luggage. So he was pretty pissed off, and he he had no clue. 
he had no clue who I was. So um, I remember standing at the curtain ready to go out, and I was kind of trying to laugh it off and be, you know, be a cool guy. And Blackjack Lanza said to me, if I were you, I wouldn't be laughing right now. <laughs> I went out there and got my ass stomped. I mean, I took an ass kick. And, uh, uh, Brody kicked me in the head so hard with a pair of tennis shoes that he juiced me right on television. He had to wear street clothes he had in the beer. What what's it like getting beaten to a pulp by Stan Hansen? <laughs> you know, back in those days, uh when we uh there, there was a crew of us out of Milwaukee, that's where I grabbed from I came from and uh it was it was it was a tough job being an enhancement talent carpenter, job jabroni, job or whatever you want to call us, because uh these guys really took it serious and uh, there was many times you know, we limp up to the car and, you know, basically could hardly even walk. And we took some serious ass kickings because, uh, uh, it's, that's just the way it was. And, you know, we didn't know any different and we, and that's how you got into the business. You know, you took, you took the ass kickings until they trusted you and then they started to trust you and then they let you do a little bit at a time. And before you know it, then, uh, you know, you were actually having some working matches with these guys, but until they got your trust, it was, it was a, it was a rough, rough time of it. That's for sure. I mean, so Stan Hansen, Stan Hansen hit me with a Larry one time so hard that he knocked me out twice. When he hit me with it, it knocked me out, and I was kind of coming too on the way down, and I hit the mat so hard it knocked me out again. So I got knocked out twice with one Larry. <laughs> so were you able to earn the trust of, of Brody and Hansen and people like that? And I guess what you I know you you were teasing about learning, but obviously you learned from guys like that. Did you did you gain their trust and be able to learn some tips from them? Oh yeah, you know, I, you know, after a while, after they see you for a while, and they know you're out there to, to make them look good, and you know, then uh, then then they start slowly giving you a little bit. You know, here we'll give you a couple arm drives in this match, or here we'll let you reverse this and see what you do, and you know, and, and then they'll call some stuff out there with you and see how you react, and and uh, you know, as as you progress and they start to feel safer with you, and uh, then they'll give you more because of the fact, you know, when. Uh, as a jobber or enhancement talent, I hate the word jobber because it's 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 looked down upon, which it shouldn't be. Because being a jobber really was an important job back in the day because you made the star shine. If you didn't make the star shine, you know who who would who would make them shine? You know. So I, I really don't like that term jobber, but I, I like the term carpenter because uh, you, you're working to to build something, which was the character or the guy that you're working with. You're working to build him up and make him a star. You know. All right. But. Uh, yeah, it was, it was it was definitely a different situation uh, back in those days. This I is the Undisputed all. Wrestling Show. We are brought to you by the Angry Marks Podcast Network and by our new friend, the WrestleWork Online Community. I'm going to kick it over to uh, get a wrestler's perspective with you, Bull, with the morning star himself, Will Huckabee. Hey, how hey, you Will, doing? Hey, what's going on? Hey, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to finally get to speak to you. Um, my my first question is, you know, being young and coming on the road, uh, who are some of the guys who actually took you under their wing and actually, I don't want to use the term, but smartened you up to uh, how things were going, especially with the boys around uh, after the after the show. Yeah, I was I was really lucky. There was a handful of us that kind of trained properly, uh, like I said, Tom Stone and uh, Jake Jake the Milkman Milliman. These guys and, and the crew in Milwaukee. There was a couple of guys. In, that were really influential in helping us. There was Chris Curtis. There was um, uh, a number of guys, and uh, you know they they really helped us out a lot and took the time out to explain to us why you did this and how you did this. And you know, of course, they beat it into us too. But you know, they they actually taught us the proper way to do things. So uh, by the time I got up to AWA and started doing TV form and stuff, I at least had an idea of what I was doing. You know, I definitely wasn't definitely wasn't a veteran or a trained wrestler. I was just, you know, I was just there. But I at least had a concept of what was going on and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it and things like that. So I got to give a lot of credit to Jake Millman and Tom Rocky Stone because without their tutelage, I think it would have been definitely maybe a different story in my in my career. You know, I, it would have been a little bit harder. I think that's for sure. Okay, now, you know, after working as a carpenter up there in uh, the AWA and stuff, you finally get your, you know, your repackage uh, as a masked character. Um, how did the entire uh, psycho gimmick and, and, and 
eventually the Texas Hangman. Um, how did that gimmick in, uh, come about? Well, you know, uh, what, what was happening was uh, in AWA, my name was Rick Gantner, and um, I had done jobs for quite a few years on TV, you know, but I was kind of being used for kind of like a Barry Horowitz. You know, I got to do a lot of things, and they even let me go over a few times on TV and stuff, and and uh, there was, you know, there was opportunity to to grow with the company, but I had been beaten so many times that I didn't think that, uh, you know, the fans would ever take me seriously, you know. So uh, I decided to go under a hood. And um, so I came up with the Texas Hangman uh, just as a singles at first, but uh, I didn't want to go on the road by myself, and I didn't, and I, I felt it was just a better gimmick, more intimidating gimmick as a tag. And I and I was always a big fan of the tag team wrestling, so uh, that's when I asked my partner, which is uh, Mike Moran. Uh, he was half of disorderly conduct, I me and Mike, and uh, so we just decided to put it together, and uh, uh, we started working together as a tag, and it really took off, and we really uh, went a lot of places, man. Texas Hangman was uh, was quite a successful tag team, really. Now I gotta ask you this question: How mad do you get? Uh, when you go to these indie shows or you're on Facebook, on social media, and you see somebody wearing one of the Texas Hangman masks, uh, how mad does that make you? You know, at first it used to really infuriate me because I used to think, uh, can I cuss on this or not? Be my yeah, guest. Is, 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 okay. uh, I mean, is this PG or, you know, I mean, I, it used to really infuriate me because I used to think, you must It's rated full pain, bull. Okay, I used to say, you know, you motherfuckers, you can't even come up with a fresh idea. You got to steal my, you know, my freaking gimmick. I mean, come on, use use some uh, engine, you know, some creativity or something. What the fuck, you know? But then I started to realize, hey, everybody gets copied. You know, I mean, there's a hundred Dorothy the clowns out there, and you know, there's and uh, you know, there's there's a tag team right now that that actually calls themselves the Texas Hangman and. They're running around working with our with our, our hoods and all that stuff. So I guess, uh, you know, being copied is flattery. I don't know. I just, uh, I, I personally don't like it, but uh, it, it, it is what it is, and you can't stop it, you know. Go ahead, Huck. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, now, you, you know, how different was it going working in Puerto Rico as opposed to working up there in the, uh, the Minneapolis area? <laughs> oh my God, brother! Working Puerto Rico, <laughs> working Puerto Rico was like walking into a twilight zone. It was uh, unbelievable. Me and my partner Mike, and uh, we finally get booked over there, and it was the craziest thing, dude. We get over there, and uh, you know, you land, you land in the airport, and nobody speaks English. We don't speak Spanish, so. We're already kind of SOL anyway, so because uh, a kid picks us up, we got to race to the TV studio because we're late, our flight was late, so we race to the TV studio, and on the way to the TV studio, we get the wreck, uh, the bumper gets ripped off the car, I mean, so we're thinking, oh, well, we're, we're not going to make the TV studio, we're just, he just grabs the bumper, throws it in the back seat of the car, says, and takes off, I said, dude, are, are we going to get in trouble on sitting around here now? Puerto Rico, the cops don't even come to rest. You just got to deal with it. And I said, I said, all right. So we get to the TV studio, and uh, they rush us into this little room. They stuff us in this little room because uh, they're doing an angle where um, Jose Gonzalez and um, and Pogo, Mr. Pogo, jumped on uh, a guy and, and beat him up really bad. And it was it was, uh, it was a terrible. You know, it was a big big angle, and we didn't have no idea what's going on. Here's a guy laying in, in, in a uh, stretcher, and he's gigging his stomach, so, so, the, cop, so, the, uh, so the people in the ambulance believe that he's really hurt, and it, it was crazy. I mean, uh, but to say the least, it, 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 we thought we, just, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to think. We were, we, were all, we were freaking out. We were going, oh, my God, what have we got ourselves into here, you know? Obviously, Puerto Rico has a rabid wrestling fan base uh you were working for the legendary carlos cologne um you know we talked to a lot of guests who you know have worked in puerto rico before and they have less than pleasurable things to say about mr cologne especially in light of the the bruiser brody you know situation over there i guess what was your overall 
feelings of working for Carlos and your take on things over there? You know, the, being a wrestler is, uh, be, to be a successful wrestler, you have to be able to adapt to things. If you can't adapt, you can't. You might as well just stay in your little area, your tri-state area, and, and work that little area, and then that's your career. You know, if you, if you want to become a world traveler and you want to work, you know, in Puerto Rico or New Zealand or Australia or Africa or uh, all these other places, Japan, you, you have to be able to adapt to their style of work. So if you can't adapt, you know, like I said, stay home. But you know, we just adapted. You know, it, it's a, it was a, it was more of a violent style. It wasn't technical. It was, uh, you know, blood and guts. And the, the crazier the match got, the crazier the people got. I mean, I can't tell you how many times there were riots. We had to fight our way back to the dressing room because the people had just gotten insane. And you know, the sometimes the, we had to call the match and fight our way back to the dressing room because uh, it just wasn't safe to be out there anymore. Did you ever hook up with Abdullah the Butcher while you were there? Oh, yeah, Abby. How can you <laughs> not like Abby? Abby's a good guy. He's hilarious. I, I just hated them damn cigars. He smoked big old fucking tree branches. And they stunk <laughs> so bad. Good God. It's like a giant dog turd he was all smoking. It was terrible. <laughs> That's terrible, brother. <laughs> But so after, a good guy. after you got done with Puerto Rico, I, I think you really started to come into your bull pain persona when you got to the global, didn't you? Yeah. Um, see, what happened though was uh, when we left Puerto Rico, uh, we went to. You got to realize when we, to, when we went to Puerto Rico, we were on top. We had the straps the whole, whole entire time we were there. We were making good money. We worked the main events all, every night. I mean, it was. Uh, Good houses. Uh, in fact, uh, PWI said uh, our our angle with uh, Carlos and Jose Gonzalez and TNT was probably one of the greatest angles that Puerto Rico Puerto Rico ever had, and it was a money drawing angle, and it was it was it was great. You know, as a career wise, that was probably one of the high. It was definitely one of the high points of my career, and uh, it was a great time there. We enjoyed it tremendously. But then we went from having giant houses and making money and working in front of crazy people and high energy to we went to Memphis and worked for USWA where everybody wants to just lay in a hole to do nothing and Southern style wrestling. And it was just, uh, it was a total culture shock and we were just so disappointed. And uh, so I don't know if you know anything about USWA, but USWA yeah. at, at the time was by far well, first of all, it was only one, one of the few territories that was even left, and also it was so political. And if you stepped on the wrong toes, good God, you know, you, they just they just destroyed you and they just made you miserable and you starved and you know you're putting two thousand miles a week on your car and you're making three hundred fifty bucks, you know, mm -hmm. working working every you know five or six nights a week, and sometimes on weekends you're working double double shots on, on Saturdays or on Sundays, you know, it was. It was, a, it, was a, it was a learning experience, you know. It just uh, was. Uh, it was nothing that I would would have suggested to anybody, but it was a, it was a great experience. I'm glad I did it. But that was definitely the end of the Texas Hangman because the stress and the it was just, it was just a lot. You know, when you're a tag team, you're married to the other guy. You see him way more than you see your family or your wife. So uh, you know you're married together, and eventually when things happen where you have no money and you're miserable and you're hurt and you're putting on 2,000 miles a week in your car and you got to decide, are we going to sleep in a hotel tonight or are we going to eat, you know, because you don't have enough money to do either or, so you just got to choose one or the other and eventually it just gets to you and, uh, you know, we, we decided we needed to take a break from each other. So, Bull, what made you decide to leave Puerto Rico, especially when you, you just said you were on top there making really good money? I guess in Puerto Rico, do they try to recycle you guys out so you don't get people don't get too tired of you or how's that work there? Well no, uh there's a weird thing in Puerto Rico. It's called rock fever. Uh, Puerto Rico's only ninety miles wide by like hundred and eighty miles long. So it's not a very big place. And uh after a while you just uh you just start losing your mind. It's it's weird. it's really strange. It's kinda of like you feel trapped, like you're in prison or something that you you can't get away and Pretty soon you 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 want to get away because 
it's so crazy and it's so insane. I could tell you stories all night long about Puerto Rico and things we saw and stuff. I mean, I seen a guy get stabbed to death right in front of my eyes, you know, and they just threw him in a ditch and nobody gave a shit about it. They didn't care. Cops didn't care. Nobody cared. There's a guy laying in a ditch dying with his guts hanging out. Nobody cared, you know. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a different world. It's, you know, even though it's part of the United States, it's, it's not part of the United States. You know, legally it is, but it sure isn't, you know. So, I mean, the cops drive around at night with their with their cherry down because they don't want to do anything. They want everybody to see them so when they come they come on the street, you know, whoever's doing something wrong gets the hell out of there so they don't have to do anything, you know? Wow. <laughs> this is, again, the Undisputed Wrestling Show. We're talking to former ECW star, WCW star, Bull Payne. Um, kick it back over to Will Huckabee for a moment. Uh, yeah, um, here's my question, uh, I guess I can call you Mr. Payne or Bull. I don't, you I don't call know. me Bull, bro. <laughs> All right, uh, Bull. Let me ask you a question. How is it working with um with Ian Rotten over there, the ECW and stuff, and doing you know a bunch of those hardcore matches, especially after leaving you know Puerto Rico and the tag team uh and, and being a part of a tag team. All right. Um, first of all, there's really bad blood between me and that asshole, so I really don't want to talk about him. But I will talk about the hardcore stuff, but I, I don't want to give him any press at all. So I'm not going to mention his fucking name on the entire show, okay? No problem. <laughs> but, but, but I don't have a problem talking about it. But if you want to ask me about hardcore, I'll be happy to talk about it. But I will not talk about that asshole, okay? So if you can reword that question, I'd be more than happy to answer it. Try okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can try it again. Um, after being a tag team in Puerto Rico and being a very successful tag team, um, how difficult uh, or challenging was it to go back as a singles wrestler uh, and work for ECW and doing some of the more uh, hardcore matches, such as the Taipei Death Match and everything? Actually, you know, uh, it was really, it was really cool. When I was in ECW, I mean, some of the greatest guys were there. I mean, I got to see. Malenko and Guerrero and Benoit and uh, and I mean the, some of the matches I got to see were just amazing. These guys, you know, I mean, uh, it, it it seemed like I always had to follow either Malenko and Guerrero or Malenko and Benoit or you know, I, but the guys that were phenomenal in the ring that I couldn't hold a candle to. There was no reason for me to even try to do a scientific wrestling match because of the fact that I would look like some like a fish out of water compared to what the fans just saw. So actually, hardcore was a blessing for me because I could do that and get away with it, and I because I couldn't try to emulate what I just saw out there. There's no way, you know. But them, them guys are working motherfuckers. I mean, they're un, they're unbelievable, you know. I I on my best day couldn't couldn't have a match like on their worst day, you know. I mean they're they're just amazing workers and that that wasn't me and that wasn't my style and for me to try to be that would be really ridiculous, you know. So uh I knew my place on the card and my place on the card was to to uh you know blood and gore and hardcore and that that was that was my place on the card. Alright, uh keep it up with that. Um are the fans at uh Juggalo Championship Wrestling are they really as uh feverish and adamant as it seems and appears in videos. And are the fans in what what federation, sir? Uh, Juggalo, JCW, Juggalo Championship oh, Wrestling. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's toned way down. Uh, when I first started working for them, it was like you were in a shooting gallery. I mean, you were getting all kinds of stuff thrown at you. It was, it was like, it was like, uh, Puerto Rico, but magnified. It was crazy. I mean, I got hit in the face with a full can of Mountain Dew. Well, I got hit with all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, you had to keep moving at all times. And finally, after a number of years, I think the fans started to realize if we keep throwing stuff at these guys, not only are we going to hurt them, but it, it, it just ruins the magnitude of the match. You can't have a good, serious match when you're worried about getting whacked in the face with a with, with a can, a full can of soda or a rock or whatever they're throwing at us. So they finally wised up to the gimmick and started letting us have matches. But at first, yeah, it was it was insane. Now, I don't want to say the guys meant to hurt us. I just think that uh, it just you know it started out with a little bit and just escalated to the point where it got to the point where who could throw the craziest stuff at the wrestlers? You know what I mean? One time they were throwing. It got so hot at the, at the gathering, which is their big 
their big to do every year. It's a giant music festival, and uh, it's one of the biggest underground music festivals in the world. And they have it every every uh, end of July, August. In fact, the last one just ended it was last weekend, and uh, it got so hot there that the fish in this one pond all died and rose to the top. And they were actually throwing dead fish at us one time when we were wrestling. And it was so disgusting. I remember in the ring almost throwing up because it stunk so bad. I'm just gagging, you know, because the fish just stunk so bad, you know, it was horrible.